Hello, I'm Deanna Tham, assistant conductor of the Jacksonville Symphony. Today I'm taking you through our third Masterworks concert, Fabio, Fauré, and Fantastique. In October of 1924, American composer Aaron Copland wrote an article for the Musical Quarterly entitled Fauré, a Neglected Master. In this article, Copland states that Perhaps no other composer has ever been so generally ignored outside his own country. The world at large has particular need of Gabriel Fauré today. In need of his calm, his naturalness, his restraint, his optimism, need, above all, of the musician and his great art. Despite what the world perceived of Fauré's work, his mastery is unmistakably evident in the writing of his Requiem. The massive scale and onerous subject matter of the Requiem, or Catholic Mass for the Dead, poses a vast challenge for only those composers of considerable depth and skill. Gabriel Fauré joins the ranks of composers like Mozart, Verdi, and Brahms to have tackled this enormous work. When asked of the impetus for the genesis of such a work, Fauré wrote a letter to conductor and musicologist Maurice Emmanuel in 1910. Dear sir and friend, my Requiem was composed for nothing, for fun, if I may be permitted to say so. It was first performed at La Madeleine for the funeral of some parishioner or other around 1890. That is all I can tell you. This frivolous reference to his own mass for the dead is where Fauré's Requiem differs from others. It is thought that while the deaths of his father in 1885 and mother in 1887 may have spurred a sense of purpose in the genesis of the piece, the overall mood of the work is categorically different from other Requiem works. Unlike its peer works, which imposingly address the themes of death, resurrection, and judgment, Foray's Requiem is rather more hymn-like, serving to comfort and offer solace to mourners instead of impressing upon them the heaviness of mortality. Foray does this right from the start, by omitting the two most imposing portions of the traditional Requiem Mass, the Dies Irae, literally translated as Day of Wrath, and Tuba Mirum, literally translated as the Trumpet, leaving prayers of eternal rest, mercy, forgiveness, and paradise. In a letter to violinist Eugène Isai, Foray mentioned of the composition that elle est d'un caractère du comme moi, it is gentle in character like myself. Foray opens his requiem with several clear ideas that illustrate the intention of his work. The simple introduction immediately establishes a gentle but firm chant-like tone without focus on melodic, orchestrational, or contrapuntal development, but rather on text. The orchestra is understated, entering with only middle and low voices in the winds, brass, and strings. Violins are not present, perhaps out of fear of being too strident and disrupting the reverent and calming tone that Foray aims to produce. Choral solemnity almost immediately gives way to a more flowing and peaceful take on the same text, Eternal Rest, highlighting Foray's unique view on death as a joyful deliverance, an aspiration towards a happiness beyond the grave rather than as a painful experience. It is notable that the Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God movement, is slightly modified to reflect Foray's view on the Mass as a prayer to grant eternal rest rather than wrath and repentance. The text is slightly modified to read, Lamb of God, grant them rest, instead of the traditional, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. The highlight of this movement is Foray's transcendent setting of the text, Lux Eterna, Eternal Light, starting with a whispered unison C in the sopranos and gently shifting the harmony, making the choir in that portion of the work glow.
Foray does not set a full movement of the Dies Irae, or Day of Wrath. He instead opts for just a small portion of the text in the Libera Me movement. Characteristic brass fanfare and punctuated diction only briefly disrupt Foray's focus on eternal rest. The final movement of Ascension to Paradise uses harps and sopranos to end the work in hope and joy. In some ways, Berlioz's fantastic symphony complements Foray's Requiem seamlessly, offering the spectacularism, grandeur, and even dies irae that the latter lacks. While Berlioz has many notable accomplishments, including winning the Prix de Rome and writing a Requiem of his own, perhaps his two best-known masterpieces are this, the Symphony Fantastique and his treatise on orchestration. These are worth mentioning together because Mr. Berlioz's astute and skillful characterization of the instruments of the orchestra gives this particular symphony a specificity of storytelling and imagery that had conceivably been unprecedented before its composition. Furthermore, use of a massive orchestra, including piccolo, English horn, four bassoons, two tubas, two harps, and two timpanists, gives expansiveness and depth to the work that allow for dramatically detailed scenery and narrative. The Symphonie Fantastique is the story of an artist tortured by an all-consuming and unrequited love. Perhaps somewhat autobiographical, it is suspected that the inspiration for the work was an actress, Harriet Smithson, who the composer saw perform in Shakespeare's Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet in 1827. Despite not speaking English, Berlioz was immediately taken by the actress's performance and began passionate and furious work on the symphony immediately after witnessing her on the stage. Berlioz wrote his own program note for the work, that he insisted be distributed to the audience upon performance. It mentions a young musician of morbid disposition and powerful imagination who poisons himself with opium in an attack of despairing passion. Each movement of the work is subtitled, depicting the tortured journey through drug-induced dreams. In these dreams, the artist's love is depicted as a specific musical idea or ide fix that obsessively permeates the work in different forms and characterizations. After a dramatically sorrowful opening of fragmented phrases and mood swings, the first iteration of the ide fix can be heard in the flute and violins, punctuated by an erratically beating heart. In disjointed, dreamlike fashion, the second movement, a ball, finds the artist amidst the merrymaking of a dance, but everywhere images of his love taunt him. The ide fix pops up in variations where least expected, intertwined in the waltz. The ball morphs into the third movement, titled In the Country. A call and answer rings out between two shepherds in the field. The ide fix is varied yet again as the artist's tortured love disturbs him even here. As the artist contemplates his own loneliness, the movement ends with the shepherd's call again, but this time with no response. In a rage that he cannot have her, the artist has killed his beloved and is being condemned and led to the scaffold for execution. In the moment before his execution, a vision of his beloved flickers through his mind once more before the final blow. Berlioz's attention to imagery and detail here is astounding, orchestrating the slice of the guillotine and the rolling of the severed head. Witches dance at the funeral of the artist on the Sabbath. The E-flat clarinet plays the theme of his beloved, but now in a grotesque, mangled form. It is combined with an ominous chorale of the Dies Irae, or Catholic funeral hymn, as the fantastic symphony whirls to its end. <laughs> 